Here I am. I, I stand at the door and knock. So to start, uh, I just want to, how many of you guys really appreciate like customer service? You know, whether it's customer service in a fast food restaurant, hotel, or your credit card, you know, um, how many of you guys really appreciate customer service? For me, I know Park, you do. For me, um, I love it. You know, when you get good customer service, I feel valued. You know, I feel like uh, they actually care about me. You know, I feel like I'm important to them. But the reverse is true too. When you receive bad customer service, it doesn't matter if you're at a great fancy restaurant or it's like a great item, um, there's like a bitter taste in your mouth. And that happened to me actually two weeks ago uh, when I was with a couple of friends. We were watching a movie called Big Hero 6. Great movie, by the way. For those of you, so if you don't know, watch it, it's great. But um, I had the worst experience of my life. Um, at that movie theater. It was actually AMC Lowe's theater. Um, but so the first thing, <laughs> the first thing that happened was I wanted to eat my chicken tender and curly fries, uh, curly, curly fries on the side. That's like my thing that I go and eat. And I was excited to eat it, to watch this movie. Great. Uh, I heard great reviews. I'm excited for it. I order it and they forget the curly fries. You know, and that's not a big deal because, you know, people make mistakes, you know, whatever that happens. I understand. But what they told me was that I had to go from the basement and to go up two flights to get my curly fries for their mistake. And on top of that, not only that, when I go into the theater and when we go into the theater, not only is it messy, but like you see stains and you see cups all over the place and they didn't clean this uh, spot. So at this point, I'm fed up. So at this point, you know, uh, when I'm experiencing this stuff, you know, I had two options. Either I could just let it go or really do something about it and, you know, bother my friends and bother the people around me. And in my mind, I thought, what would Andrew Park do? <laughs> now, if you know anything about Andrew Park, Park is a one person that knows about value. He is a big stickler about customer service. And if you ever hang out with him long enough, You'll learn the art of negotiation. You'll learn the art of haggling. And somehow you'll receive more than you actually what you put in. So that came into my mind and I was learning about it. And you know, I was like, you know what? I have to say something about this. Not only is it robbing value from me, but even the store too and people around me. So I told the manager, I was like, hey, dude, this is not cool. I'm paying $16 to watch a cartoon. And I'm experiencing all this stuff. $16, how crazy is that? And you know what? The cool thing was this. They compensated the whole theater, the whole, uh, the whole movie. So we got another movie for free, which is pretty cool. Uh, but in the same way, I think for a lot of us, when it comes to our relationship with God and um, our, I guess you could say, connection to God, it's a lot like um, my story here where it's a lot about compensation. That we feel like God... Uh, is expecting to compensate us for, or looking for compensation for our mistakes, our sins, the messes that we made in our lives. And even though the, we hear about the gospel and the message that says that God is a, a God of love and compassion, a lot of times we come to God out of fear and obligation. And so because of that and because we have this God that is almighty and powerful and strong and righteous, we come in more of a transactional type of relationship with God, where when we meet with God and we have a relationship with Him and we do something wrong, we try to make up with it with our behavior to do the right things, not because we want to, but because we have to. Or we have this idea that, um, that it's all about behavior, so as we go and we meet with God and connect with God, we think that if we do the right things and we do the good things, that God will bless us. And we respect God and our faith is framed around that. So it's not about a, a, a life of faith of mercy and grace, but it's about fear and merit. It's about what you put in and what you put out. But here's what the Bible says about this. And you'll see that in Galatians 4, uh, 4 to 6. And unfortunately, this monitor is not there, but I'll read it up here. It says, but when the set time has fully come, God set his son, born of a woman, 
born under the law to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoptions to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. And that's from Galatians 4, 4 to 6. And so I, uh, for those who are new here, we've been in this series called Abba, Abba, Father. And, we've been, and as you know, that for those here that have been learning about this, Abba is an intimate term to relate to, uh, to your dad. So in context, it could mean, you know, daddy or dada, you know, papa. You know, it's, it, if, to put it into better context, it's when a baby's starting to learn words and he's starting to talk to his child, you know, he says, you know, tries to say father or dad, he says dada. But in Aramaic, it's translated to Abba. And in this passage, in this text in Galatians, that's what um, entire scripture is telling what a relationship is supposed to be like. That to God and, and the way he sees us and the way he views us, it's not some type of slavery or work type of righteousness type of relationship, but it's one from an intimate parent to a child, a father to a son and daughter. And, the, and that's what I want to talk about today as we go into Luke 15. Um, because I believe when we see ourselves, it's important to know how God sees us. And to God, what he sees is a child that's either, either lost or found. It doesn't matter what you are or what you do or where you come, came from or what you have done or what you will do. To God, the only thing he sees is lost children and found children. And he's seeking to see um, his ch- children come home. And that's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 15. We're going to talk about what it really means to be an Abba child. So we'll go to Luke 15. And what you have to understand as we go into this uh, passage and uh, the story is that Jesus is talking to, um, in the framework, to the Pharisees and tax collectors. And what's interesting about, and actually if you know anything about this story, um, or you grew up in church, this is a very familiar story. Usually it's titled the prodigal son or the lost son. But if you look carefully into the story, what's interesting is the fact that I think that's actually a pretty bad title because if you look carefully, uh, uh, the story doesn't have just one lost son. He actually has two. But um, as we go into the story, what you actually see that the central figure isn't his lost or fa- the lost sons. It's actually more about the father. <coughs> that the central figure and actually the, the very scandalous and surprising thing about the story is how the father actually interacts with both his lost son. And this is really important because, as I said before, uh, the people that are listening to this, the Pharisees, like it says in verse 1 and 2, and the tax collectors, and the sinners, and the teachers of the law are listening into this, and they are going to be in a great surprise because Jesus is going to show them a great twist of who God the Father is. Because to them, God the Father is a distant God. You know, God is for them if they are following the right ways and the right rules like many of us have thought and sometimes operate in. And here, God gives a totally different worldview, a totally different picture of who God the Father is and who God uh, the Abba is, and we're going to look into here. And we'll go into this. It says, verse 11, it says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided uh, the property between them. So in other words, what the younger son is really saying, he says, Father, you're dead to me because I want my inheritance now and I want all the money and I want to live on my own. And then verse 13 says, not long, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off to a distant country and squandered his wealth in wild living. Pretty much he went to college. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe va- famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill the stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And then 17 says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. But this is the crazy twist. And he says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned the heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy 
to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So he began to celebrate. What you, uh, what you have to understand about the story is that when the Pharisees and the sinners and all the people that were listening to him were hearing the story, right at the point where the son was feeding himself to pigs and slowly going to the father, they expected that to be the moral of the story. For a lot of them, when they're hearing this and they're hearing this, uh, the audience is hearing this, they're saying, wow, this younger son deserves what he gets. Not only did he reject the father, not only did he uh, yell at the father, not only did he tarnish his reputation, he squandered everything that the father gave him. And for people that are living in this honor and shame culture, they believed or they thought that would be the moral of the story. And the crazy twist about this is that as as they're sharing that, Jesus totally turns it around with them and saying, the father, even though the son did all these things, came around, and said he had so much compassion about him that he loved him and he cared for him and, re- and was so eager to love him and wrapped his arms around him. For example, um, probably a year ago, uh, I lent my parents' car to a really close friend, to, friend of mine. I will not tell you who it is, but I will tell you he is a childhood friend of mine. Okay? You could, you could figure out who it is. And, um, you know, he was like, oh, I have an errand to run. Um, you know, they were on vacation, so I had the car to my parents' house, and I was, uh, you know, with my parents' car, and I was like, you know what, it's not a big deal. I was like, you know, don't worry about it. Just make sure you bring it back. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> the worst happened. <laughs> <laughs> he got into a car accident. Thankfully, he was fine, right? He, he was okay. But, dude... It cost over $10,000 in damages. Not only in that car, this car, but it was hit the other car too. And the worst part, it was totally his fault. <laughs> it was totally his fault. And dude, he came to me and he was like, dude, that's the bad news. I was like, oh boy. Oh uh, no, what happened? He's like, dude, I got into a car accident with your parents' car. And dude, I was pissed. The Staten Island came out to me and I was like, bro. I was like, what the heck happened, bro? Like... Dude, you know it's not my car. Come on, man. And to tell you the truth, I was so pissed. I was so pissed off. I was like, dude, I said, yo, this guy is going to pay every single penny to my parents. It's not about me. It's my, it's my parents' car. You, you, yo, you're going to have to pay. I don't care. You're going to have to work at whatever Target or whatever for like the days of your life. You're going to be there forever. I talked to my parents. I tell them what they do, and I thought they were going to be, you know, agree to me, right? Well, you know what they did? They yelled at me. <laughs> they were mad at me. I was like, why are you mad at me? He's like, you're the one that gave him the car. And I was like, oh, crap, you're right. And they're like, so what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do? And, you know, he knew, they knew that um, he was my child, and I was like, what am, what am I supposed to do? I'm not going to get money from him. One, he's your close friend. Two, he has no money. <laughs> you know and he said, you know, and, he, and what they said was, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. Let him go. And you know what, guys? That's the gospel. Um, that's exactly what happened in, the, um, in this parable here. That the price that was paid uh, for, your, for your sins and my sins, your mistakes and my, our brokenness and all that kind of stuff was paid by Jesus Christ. And it was because he died and rose again and um, died for our sins. We have the accessibility and the the openness to come to the Father whenever we want, whenever we want. And the crazy and scandalous idea about this passage and this truth is that no matter what you've done or where you've gone or where you come from or where you have been, the Father, the truth of the Father is, is that He will come to you with open arms. That in in house, in His house, um, His house is always welcome. His, the door is always open. And that's the first point I want to make. What, what is what is the first point of being Abba child is this. God will always welcome you back home. It's an incredible compassion. Now, the crazy thing about God's love and the mystery about God's love is this, is that he will give you the freedom, just like the younger son, to do wherever you want, whatever you want, and even give you the freedom to reject him and to leave him. 
so in hopes that you would actually one day choose to love him back. See, the mystery about God's love is that he doesn't want to force you to love him. The mystery about God's love is that he is not about the battle of the behavior. He's about winning the battle of the heart. And because he cares more about winning the battle of the heart than your behavior and your righteousness or the good things or the bad things that you do because he's, uh, he sees you as a son and daughter, he's willing to let you go in hopes to wait patiently to bring you back. And I believe that prophetically that for some of us, some of us are there. You know, some in this place where we're in between, we're not sure where we're going, and you know what? And, you know what? Um, and you, we think the grass is greener on the other side, and the truth of, God, the truth of the matter is, guys, God is giving you the freedom to seek and to search and to find out. I know some of my closest friends who had to discover that for themselves. They had to go far away, somewhere upstate or far to a distant country, to figure out what they needed to do, and what they had to do, and just to hear God and the loving, unconditional love and says, I'm going to bring you back home. That's the measure of love in God's grace. That's the power of God's grace. And, you know, the truth is, I'll tell you, you know, it's stupid to leave. I'll tell you that. You know, to tell you, honestly, it's dumb to leave. But honestly, for some of us, we have to, to figure that out. And the crazy thing is God and his everlasting love and compassion and mercy is willing to let us and lose us to win us back. For some of us, we're not there. We're like the younger son who realized, wow, it's really stupid to try to live on our own. And we've done stupid things and we've done foolish things and we've caught, fallen into a place of shame and burden. And you're questioning and you're wondering, God, is it okay? can I go back to God? What do I need to do to go back to him? Maybe I have to uh, shape things up into my life. I have to fix certain things to go back and meet with God. And the truth of the matter is what God is saying to you is that it doesn't matter how far you've gone. My grace reaches even the darkest parts of your soul. And he is here to come to welcome you back home. The fact of the matter is, God wants to restore you and I. Not because of what we've done or what we're doing or who we are or who we're becoming to be. The main thing that God wants to do in this passage and, and remind us too that God wants to restore our identity in him. The thing that God cares about the most is God wants to restore and reconcile our relationship with him and the personhood that we are, Abba's child. We are the sons and daughters of God. And you know, that's crazy because even for me, for people that struggle with performance and shame all the time, this is probably one of the most hardest things to do because, you know, we operate so much and the world operates so much on what we do. Our identity is based on what we do, how we perform, and how well we do things. It's... It's based on merit, but God and, and Jesus here, when he's talking about the God, the Father, and who we are in our lives, he's shattering all that stuff, and he said, it's not about who you are, what you do, it's about who you are, and that's what he cares about, and that's what he wants to restore, and that's what he wants to reach to in your life. So wherever you might be in the younger son, whether you might be far away or close or in between, I just want to let you guys know that God, the Father, loves you, he cares for you, and in the Father's house, He's ready to welcome you back home. He's patiently waiting. But that's not it. There's more to the story, and we're going to go into it now. Um, the oldest brother came, became angry, and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you, have o you are always with me, and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And what you have to understand uh, about the story is that not, not just the younger son um, uh, disrespected the father, but the act of the father not going in and celebrating when the father was having a feast was also an act of rebellion. You know, uh, back, in, uh, back in Jesus' time, that would warrant a slap in his face, really. And it would actually show that a more disrespect to the family and the family name rather than what the younger son did. But in spite of all that, the father even goes out, even in the midst of celebration, to the older brother because of what, what's going on. 
And the question is, why does he go out of his way for the younger son? Why would he go even that far, even though he's disrespecting the father? And the answer is this, because what he wants from the older son is that he wants to invite him in to the joy that he's experiencing. For example, yesterday. Guys, if you haven't been there, you got to come next week because Thanksgiving was awesome. That Thanksgiving pot was awesome. You guys did an amazing job. Like, I couldn't eat after I had food coma. I was trying to finish the message, and I was just like, dude, this is crazy. And it was incredible to see because I love 180 because when we do potlucks, we do it well. I mean, the truth is, um, we even made a 30-pound turkey for everyone to eat, and it was so delicious. I helped cook. Not really. But <laughs> it was Andrew Park that actually cooked that 30-pound turkey, but dude, it, it was amazing. We had, we had turkey, we had ham, we had all this kind of stuff, so much that even some random people from I have no idea where they came from, <laughs> started to come in and trickle in. And I think that's a really good picture, oh, I'm sorry, uh, a really good picture of what the Father's house is like. It's a place where it's open. It's where there's an incredible feast, where we dine in and anybody, whether lost or found, can come home and feel the warmth and joy of the love of the Father. And um, that's what we want to do actually for Advent, uh, this coming next week. Um, what we want to do is start actually baptizing people at, at, uh, at service right now. The people that have come to Christ, the people that have dedicated their life to Christ who haven't been baptized yet, what we want to do is start introducing their stories in the middle of service and just share a little bit about their story so that we could actually celebrate with them about the work and the power that God has in their life and in our life. And what we want, the reason why we want to do this and we start want to put this, uh, putting this in our service is because we want to reflect what it is in Luke 15, where when we come into the service that there is a reason why we're celebrating. There's a reason why we're coming in here. There's a re and be reminded that why we do what we do is not just, just for selfish reasons. You know, it's not like the father's like saying that where is my inheritance, but, but acknowledging, well, we already have an inheritance in here and that we're sharing in God's joy because there is one, just one person coming into this house, and that one person warrants a celebration. The, and the crazy thing about the story, and I think what we have to be reminded of again and again because we're being so lost in the world and just the busyness of the world, is that God cares for even that one person. That he is willing to celebrate in heaven and, in, and on earth. He is ready to get the angels together and be like, we're going to party again. I love it that it says... God loves to party. It, it just shows that. Um, if you see in, in the Gospels and um, Jesus, he always talks about heaven being about a wedding and a feast. It's a party every time. It's about the nightclubs without the drinking every time. But that's really the message of the gospel. You know, a lot of times we find ourselves struggling a lot of times. We find ourselves um, sometimes bored a lot of times. But I think when we come back into the story and be reminded of why we do what we do and invite people and having them know and be dedicated to Christ and go back to the house of God, we are reminded that what we're doing here impacts eternity. And that warrants a celebration even for one person. And for us, that, for, some, for, for some of us, that means that that one person actually matters, that you matter, and God cares about you and me and the people in the world. And so, and for some of us that have a, have a hard time struggling um, and seeing, you know, the darkness of the world, it's about an invitation to choose joy every day. And that every, every week that we come here and we see these things, what, we're, what God is welcoming, welcoming us to is a life of joy and celebration and redemption and restoration in our lives. So uh, what does it mean to be Abba child? Is this. God's always inviting you to a celebration, an incredible joy. So I pray as we stand that you join with me, that we pray for this startup and for the people that are coming in and that there will be an anointing and a power and just a joy that comes in every Sunday we come in, um, starting from Advent. So would you please stand with me? Um, please uh, close your eyes. and um, Father, I just want to come and I want to pray uh, for your spirit to come here, Lord. Lord, right now I just pray for the spirit of Abba Father to come in. 
And Lord, speak to us, God, about who you are again. Will you lift your hands with me to the Lord? Let's receive his love and go to the Father. This is an anthem of God's amazing generosity toward whether lost or found sons or daughters. Let's sing together. Make it our prayer. Father, we come before you this afternoon with a vision of Abba. And Abba, we declare it again that fundamentally, when you arrived, everything changed about our relationship with you. Now we belong to you. We call you Abba and not just God. God is your job. Abba is who you are to us. You have a direct access to Abba today. Not because you deserve it, not because of merit, but because of the work of Jesus on the cross and his life. So for just a couple of moments, would you, as you pray and seek him in your heart, Will you press in and break away the mental barriers of shame and guilt or even pride and let him love you today?
Holy Spirit, I want to pray right now that you would just release a spirit of love, Abba's love, the fact that we belong to you. The Bible tells us that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor principalities, or power can separate us from the love of God. Jesus said that no one could snatch you out of my Father's hands. Will you receive and embrace and walk in and swim in this truth today? Just for that moment, press in. sing this with us and repeat it and I want you to press in to God sing it sing it into the truth embrace it and walk in it sometimes you gotta sing your way into the truth sometimes you gotta sing your way into the truth you gotta sing your way into the truth you gotta sing your way into the truth Sing your way into the truth. You gotta sing your way into the truth. You gotta sing your way into the truth. You gotta sing your way to the truth. Father, right now we pray that you would help us fight to walk out the generosity of the Father. And as sons and daughters that have inherited the kingdom of God and the love of God. So today I bless you with forgiveness. I bless you with the prosperity of God's love. And I pray that as you leave this place, it would shape and define who you are, not anything else. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? pray as Paul says may the height and the width and the length and the vastness of the love of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit fill you and carry you your whole life now and forever all God's people say Amen, God bless you Go in peace.